Amen. Good morning, church. I hope you all are doing well. Are you excited to worship Jesus this morning? I know we all are excited to worship Him because He rules and reigns. Amen. You know, this is the day that the Lord has, you know, given. We need to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Can we just sing the songs and rejoice in the presence of God? Here you go. I know you rescued my soul His blood has covered my sins I believe, yeah I believe My shame is taken away My pain is still in His name I believe, yeah I believe Come on, can we sing it together? Cause I know you rescued my soul his blood has covered my sins. I believe, yeah. I believe. My shame is taken away. My pain is still in His name. I believe, yeah. I believe. As I raise the banner. My Lord has conquered the grave, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives. Come on, you sing, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives. I know you rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sins. I believe. I believe. My shame is taken away. My pain is still in His name. I believe. I believe. I raise the banner. Oh. My Lord has conquered the grave. My Redeemer lives. 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 My Redeemer To see your kingdom come My Redeemer lives Come on, sing My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives My Redeemer Oh, <laughs> Tu badshah hai, is dil ka tu badshah hai. Is dil ka tu badshah hai, is dil ka tu badshah hai. Is dil ka tu badshah hai, is dil ka tu badshah hai. Is dil ka tu badshah hai, is dil ka tu badshah
Rei hey, tu a valor tu a querer é tu a valor tu a querer esse dil ka tu badshah é esse dil ka tu badshah Rei hey, tu a valor tu a querer é esse dil ka tu badshah é tu a valor tu a querer é इस दिल का तू बादशाह हे हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा ओ हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा ओ हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा रिश्तो की विराग तू है रिश्तो की विराग तू हे बजते तेरा नाम यीशु है बजते तेरा नाम यीशु है रिश्तो की विराग तू है रिश्तो की विराग तू हे बजते तेरा नाम यीशु है बजते तेरा नाम यीशु रिश्तो की राग तू है बजते तेरा नाम यीशु है फरिश्तो की भी राग तू है बजते तेरा नाम यीशु हे हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा ओ हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा ओ हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा ओ हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा सब के हालेलुया 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 हे संग मिल गाए हालेलुया संग मिल गाए हालेलुया हे हालेलुया हालेलुया मिल गाए हालेलुया हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा ओ हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा ओ हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा हे जावेदा यीशु मसीहा थैंक यू हेवनली फादर फॉर योर प्रेजेंस इन दिस प्लेस लॉर्ड Lord we believe Lord Jesus your presence is here. We believe Lord Jesus that you're moving right now Lord Jesus. Thank you Lord. We believe Lord Jesus where your spirit is Lord there is freedom Lord. Where your spirit is Lord Jesus there is victory Father. Lord we believe this morning oh Lord Jesus Father that your spirit will set us free oh God Lord Jesus from all the bondages from all the Lord Jesus areas of our life Lord Jesus which is holding us back oh God Father Lord Jesus. Father we believe Lord Jesus there is freedom that is going to be released right now as we worship your father. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Father. Thank you Jesus. spirit of the lord is there is freedom with the spirit of the lord is there is freedom lift your eyes to heaven there is freedom lift your eyes to heaven there is freedom 
Lift your eyes to heaven There is freedom Freedom reigns in this place Showers of mercy and grace Falling on everything There is freedom Jesus reign Jesus reigns in this place Showers of mercy and grace Falling on every face, there is freedom. If you're tired and thirsty, there is freedom. If you're tired and thirsty, there is freedom. Give your love to Jesus. There is freedom Give your all to Jesus There is freedom Freedom reigns in this place Showers of mercy and grace Falling on every face There is freedom Freedom reigns Freedom reigns in this place Showers of mercy Mercy and grace falling on every face. There is freedom, Jesus. Jesus reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace. Falling on every face, there is freedom. Jesus reign in this place. Showers of mercy and grace. Falling. freedom Lord thank you Heavenly Father Lord Jesus for this wonderful morning that you could come together to worship you to exalt your name Lord Jesus you deserve our glory you deserve our praise oh God Father In the mighty name of Jesus Christ we pray Amen
and greetings to each one of you in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There are times in our lives when we go through seasons where we feel that life is very difficult, when we know that the going is very tough and life is very hard. Everything and everyone seems to be beating very hard upon your life. And there are times when you have experienced failures and falls in your life. And because of all these past experiences, we tend to set boundaries in our minds and we cannot look beyond ourselves we cannot look beyond our situations so today even as you look into God's word I want you to listen to this video a very short video about a story of an elephant who is tied to a rope I know that you might be aware of the story but let's take a minute to listen to this story on this video as a man was passing the elephants he suddenly stopped, confused by the fact that these huge creatures were being held by only a small rope tied to their leg. No chains, no cages. It was obvious that the elephants could, at any time, break away from their bonds, but for some reason they did not. He saw a trainer nearby and asked why these animals just stood there and made no attempt to get away. Well, trainer said, when they are very young and much smaller, we use the same size rope to tie them, and at that age, it's enough to hold them. As they grow up, they are conditioned to believe that they cannot break away. They believe the rope can still hold them, so they never try to break free. The man was amazed. These animals could at any time break free from their bonds, but because they believed they couldn't, they were stuck right where they were. Like the elephants, how many of us go through life hanging on to a belief that we cannot do something simply because we failed at it once before? Failure is a part of learning. We should never give up the struggle in life. So even as you have seen this story, about this elephant who has been tied to a rope and he has all the potential to break himself free but yet his mind has been functioning now that I cannot break free. His mind has been already programmed in such a manner and there are times because of the failures that we experience our vision in life also is hampered. But today I believe that God is calling us to look beyond ourselves. God is inviting us to look beyond the situations that we are in right now. And He's calling us to look up to Him and to see what He is saying about your life. So even as we prepare our hearts to hear God's word, let us pray and commit this time and this word into the Lord's hand. Dear Father, we want to thank you for this moment. That even as we come to this time of hearing your word, we know that your word is living and active. And Father, today I pray that even as I speak forth your word, let your word go forth and not come back void. Let your word accomplish your purpose into each and every one of our lives, O oh Lord God. I bind every distractions, I bind every work of the enemy. And I pray, Lord, it is not in me, but Holy Spirit, you will speak your word through me and you will do your mighty work in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So even as today we look into the book of Judges, and the book of Judges is a very, very interesting book. In fact, the whole Bible has got a lot of things to be uh, learning from. 
But in the book of Judges, we find about some of the great legends. How can you miss the great and mighty Samson? But along with this great and mighty men of God, we also come across some little legends, very unknown legends. Have you heard about the very first judge in the book of Judges? His name was Othniel. Have you heard about Ehud and Shamgar? God used this little known legends to judge Israel. And about uh, a couple of months back or something around four months ago, we had gone through the life of Deborah. She was the first woman judge who judged Israel. And she was a prophetess and she was a courageous woman. And we learned a lot, a great deal about this particular woman. And carrying on from her life, we see that God used her to judge Israel for 40 years. And Bible says that Israel had peace for 40 long years. And it appears to be that Israel must have got fed up of the peace. That in Judges chapter 6, verse 1, we see that Israel, the children of Israel, did evil in the sight of the Lord once again. And that is a very, very sad story because this sort of cycle keeps on repeating in the lives of the children of Israel. They will sin against God, they will do evil against God, they will abandon God, and then they go into bondage. And as we catch this episode in Judges chapter 6, we find that because Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord, God handed them over to Midianites. In fact, because of the evil deeds, they themselves opened up the doors of their lives and their community so that their enemies would attack and subdue them and keep them in bondage. The Bible says that for seven years, the hand of Midian was so oppressive over the Israelites that the Israelites had to leave their homes, had to leave their land, and they were dwelling in the clefts of the mountains. They were dwelling in dens and in caves. And it's not only that, but the Bible says that whenever they would come to a time of harvesting their corn, their field, their crops, what we find is that the Midianites, the Amalekites, and some other tribes would come and destroy the crops. And I'm so surprised by this group of people, the Amalekites and the Midianites. I thought like at least they would take the crops and enjoy that. But we see their destructive nature to such an extent that neither did they enjoy the crops or the harvest, nor did they allow the Israelites to enjoy the labor, the fruit of their labor. And we can see here, because of this continuous attack by the enemy, we see that Israel had become impoverished and it went on for seven long years. What was the reason for this impoverished situation? It is because there was a spiritual poverty. And because of the spiritual poverty that they had abandoned God and moved away from God, because they had an evil in the eyes of God. Later on in chapter 6, we come across they had already established and built altars for the gods of the Amorites. They had built altars for the pagan gods, for the god of Baal and for the god of Asherah. And we can see that all this worship, false worship was going on. And because of all this, there was spiritual poverty, spiritual barrenness. And through all that, we can see that there was economic distress in the land of Israel. Because the protection of God had gone away, they were vulnerable to the attacks of their enemies. And we can see that for seven years, they kept on harassing the children of Israel. So much so, after seven years, in verse number seven, of Judges chapter 6, we find that the Israelites cried out to the Lord. I am amazed. It took them seven years to realize that, that they have a God whose name is Yahweh. They have a God who is a merciful, loving God who answers their prayers. They have a God who is a living God. After seven years, Bible says, they cried out to the Lord and praise God that we have a God of grace and mercy, a God who does not keep records of our wrong when we ask forgiveness. We see that the Lord sends a prophet and the prophet reminds the Israelites in verse number 7, it says, 
the god of israel is saying to you children of israel what is the lord of israel saying i brought you out of egypt god brought them out of egypt i took you out from the land of slavery i rescued you from the hand of the egyptians it is not your might but i rescued you the lord is reminding them i delivered you from their hand they were oppressing you they were oppressing your uh, forefathers four generations were being oppressed in egypt but i am the god who delivered you out of their hands and not only that i drove out before you the inhabitants of the land of canaan the land which you are supposed to possess the land which you are living now in in turmoil the inhabitants of this land i am the lord god who drove this inhabitants out and gave you this land as inheritance and i told you i gave you a command what was the command which the lord gave the lord said i am the lord your god do not worship the god of the amorites in whose land you live but you have not listened to me that's what the word of the lord came to this unnamed prophet and israelites received this word and they realized yes we have made a mistake rather than worshiping this living god when they had experienced 40 years of peace under deborah now for past 7 years they are going through devastating times destructive times well they cried out to god god answered their prayer by sending a prophet and giving them a reason and today we will catch on from verse number 11 of judges chapter 6 So if you have your bibles open we look into judges chapter 6 verse number 11 and it says in verse number 11 then the angel of the lord came and sat under the oak that was in ophra which belonged to joash the abizarite as his son gideon was beating out the wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the midianites so here we see that the angel of the lord is appearing to a man called gideon who is from the clan of abizarite and his father's name is joash and here is gideon who is doing some sort of a work some sort of an occupation my dear friends if god wants to use you or if you have a desire to be used by god first and foremost i want to tell you my dear friends that be occupied in what god has entrusted you in this particular given moment don't look for big things to happen and then i will do that big thing but whatever little thing that god has given into you, your hands learn to be faithful learn to be diligent in that work and god will bless you and the lord will increase you in the gospel of luke chapter 16 verse number 10 jesus says that if you be faithful in the little which god gives to you god will make you and trust you bigger and greater things what we can see over here that gideon was busy doing something we see in the bible on different occasions that god encounters people who were occupied in the occupation no matter how small no matter how noble it might be look at moses moses at the age of 80 he's almost retired there's no real great hope and future and vision for his life but at the age of 80 he is faithfully taking care tending the flock of his father in law in the land of midian and that's the place where in, on mount horeb he sees a burning bush and he encounters and has a discussion with god almighty and that encounter brought change in moses life look at peter peter was so discouraged that particular day but bible says as jesus walked <clears throat> along the lake of galilee and as he was walking he saw peter and there was peter cleaning the nets maybe he is preparing uh, himself and the nets and the, maybe the boats for that particular evening as they are, as they are planning to go into the sea of galilee to catch the next night's catch so we can see peter was occupied doing something and jesus approaches peter and asks peter can i use your boat to preach and then we know what happened later on look at nehemiah he was faithfully serving the king of susa artaxerxes 
and he was a faithful cupbearer in the court of the king and that's where God picks him up and he becomes the rebuilder of the walls of Jerusalem. Look at Saul who went on to become Paul. He also was busy doing something. Yes, he was doing a lot of anti-Christian activities and he was on the way to Damascus with a vision, with a mission that I will go to Damascus and destroy the Christians over there, destroy the church over there. In that particular journey, he encounters Jesus Christ and his life was transformed. Look at Matthew, the tax collector. He was busy collecting taxes, counting how much he has collected. And as Jesus is passing by, he tells to Matthew, come, follow me. And Matthew leaves everything and starts following Jesus and he becomes an apostle and a gospel writer. So first thing I want to tell you is that we need to be occupied in what God has given into our hands. No matter how small it might be, no matter how big it might be, let's learn to be faithful. And then God will enlarge it. And what we can see in this particular verse is that Gideon or threshing wheat. Do you know where the wheat is threshed? It is always threshed in a threshing floor, which is a, usually an open flat surface that is smooth and hard. The process of threshing was performed generally by spreading the sheaves on the threshing floor and causing the oxen and the cattle to tread repeatedly over them, thereby loosening the edible part of the grain from the scaly, inedible chaff that surrounds it. On occasion, sticks were used for this purpose. Then winnowing folks were used to throw the mixture into the air so the wind could blow away the chaff, leaving only the good grain on the floor. You can see it in the image. But where was Gideon threshing the wheat? He was not threshing on the threshing floor, but he was threshing, the Bible says, in a wine press. What is a wine press? In the ancient world, the wine press was a large basin where men would tread grapes. They would hold on to ropes above them and stamp their feet. The juice would run into containers on the sides of the large basin. Sometimes the wine press would be dug out in which the grapes were treaded and through channels the juice would be collected in the troughs below it. Wine presses are found in almost every part of Palestine. Between Hebron and Beersheba, they are found on all the hilly slopes. They abound in southern Judea. Common, they are common in the valleys of Carmel and are numerous in Galilee. And wine press is not an ideal place to thresh the wheat because you need an open space and wine press are a small dugout either on the foothills or a small dugout in the land. But Bible says Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press. Why? Could be he was afraid of the Midianites. And the Bible says that he was doing this in order to hide it from the Midianites. So one thing what we can say about Gideon is that, that there is a part of courage in him. That yes, I have been able to gather some wheat, some harvest. I need to thresh it so that I can uh, separate the shaft from the wheat and take the wheat for my family so I can feed my family. At the same time, he is fearful. That's why he is doing it in a wine press, hidingly. So there is one side fear and one side a sense of responsibility in Gideon's life. And as Gideon is doing this, in verse number 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and spoke to him. This is a marvelous point in Gideon's life because from this point, the life of Gideon is going to be changed. He is no longer going to be the Gideon of the past, but he is going to be the Gideon who is courageous and he is going to become the Gideon who goes on to become the judge of Israel. The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. He had an encounter. Whenever we have an encounter with the Lord, our lives are bound to change. Like last week I was sharing about the life of Jacob and how Jacob struggled all through his life. He struggled to get the birthright. He struggled to get the blessing. Then for 20 years he worked with his uncle Laban in Haran. And after 20 years, 
he struggled he has gone through lot of travail in his life and now he is encountering that particular night near the river jabok a man a angel of the lord and bible says in that encounter he wrestles the whole night till daybreak he wrestles with that angel of the lord and that encounter with the man that encounter with the angel of the lord changed jacob's life in fact first and foremost it changed his name and the angel of the lord said now on you shall not be called jacob but you shall be called israel because you have struggled with god and with men and you have prevailed that was a change in jacob's life because from there on we can see how his relationship with esau gets restored how his life gets restored so we see that whenever we have an encounter with the lord some drastic change comes into our lives and that's what happened in gideon's life he says the angel of the lord appeared to him and said to him something what did the angel of the lord say to gideon it's very important to note the first phrase which the angel says here is the lord is with you that's a wonderful phrase we all love to hear that word we find so comforting we find it so consoling when we know yes the lord almighty is with us that's why jesus is called emmanuel god with us god the father is for us but jesus is with us and he has given us a promise of the holy spirit who is in us so here the angel of the lord says to gideon the lord is with you what a comforting phrase is this it's very important to know whether the lord is with you or not when moses encountered god in that burning bush the lord said to moses in exodus chapter 3 verse number 12 i will be with you as i am sending you to egypt as i'm sending you to go to speak to pharaoh i will be there with you what a comforting phrase and promise the lord says i will be with you and that is what Christ Jesus is saying to each one of you who are listening he says in Matthew chapter 28 verse number 20 as you walk in obedience to my word i shall be with you till the end of the age sometime your spouse may leave you maybe because of death but Jesus says i will be with you till the end of the age sometime your best friend may leave you for whatever reasons but jesus your very best friend says i shall be with you till the end of the age that's a great promise that you and i as a born again child of god has got and that's what the angel said to gideon the lord is with you what the what a statement to hear in this particular hour when gideon is full of fear threshing the wheat in the wine press your true destiny is determined when god is with you and can you see in this particular verse the perspective of god towards gideon how god is looking at gideon how god is viewing gideon god says through this angel of the lord o valiant warrior o mighty man of valor and if we look and we have heard what uh, gideon has been doing i think so valiant and gideon are two opposites here is gideon full of fear here is gideon trying to hide what he has got and trying to thresh in the wine press just hoping that the midianites don't come just hoping that somehow he will do this and take this wheat to his family so that he can feed his family and on the contrary the angel of the lord is declaring to gideon you are a mighty man of valor that is god's perspective about gideon and that is god's perspective about your life when the lord almighty god is with you he has the same perspective that's what it says in jeremiah 29 look at the whole bible jeremiah 29 verse number 11 through 13 what is god saying through jeremiah to his people you and i who have been purchased by the precious blood of jesus are his people and this is what god says i know the thoughts that i think towards you says the lord thoughts of peace not of evil because of your past failures you have filled your mind with thoughts of evil 
Because all things are breaking down in your life, you're thinking that everything is going to be bound now and I cannot see the future. There is no hope. But the Lord is saying, I have got thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Verse 12 says, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. The promise of God is that when we call to him, he will listen to us. Verse 13 of Jeremiah 29 says, and you will seek me and find me. What a promise that when you seek God, you will find God. When you search for me with all your heart, that is a problem. We don't search God with all our heart. We just search God by saying, Oh Lord, awesome God, please come and touch me and heal me. Please come and change my situation. Nothing happened. Okay, come on. I will try to look at some other solution. I will try to call somebody else. I will look some other way. Imagine if you have got from someone a hundred thousand rupees, a good substantial amount, a check, and suddenly you find that it's not there in your purse. Oh, you're searching on the table, at the side table, you're searching in your desk, everywhere you're searching. How will you search for that amount of check which you have got and you cannot find it? You will search frantically. You will search diligently. In the same manner. Are you searching God in that same diligent manner? And the Bible says, when you search for me with all your heart, you will find me. And when you find God in your life, you will come to know his promises that he said, I'll be there with you. And where he is saying that I have got thoughts concerning you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, thoughts to prosper you and to give you a hope and a future. No matter, there is all hopelessness around your life. That was the situation when Gideon encountered this angel. There was hopelessness around impoverished condition they were living in fear they were living near the mountains in caves and dens but in the midst of that hopeless situation God encounters Gideon and speaks to Gideon and speaks to him saying that you are a mighty man of valor and that's what God is telling you if you are that person today as you are listening you are thinking of giving up you're thinking that, no, I cannot look beyond myself. I cannot look beyond my situation. I cannot look at what is going to happen in my life. There is no hope. There is no future. God is telling you to look today beyond your situation, beyond your life, to look at Him. What God is telling about your life. Well, God's perspective of, of Gideon was fantastic, was great. What is Gideon's perspective about God? That's what we see in verse number 13. Verse 13 says, Then Gideon said to the angel of the Lord, Oh my Lord, like, you know, thank you very much for appearing. Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, big question, you know, if always stands stiff. It says, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? He must be thinking, he must be playing in his mind. We are impoverished, we are working hard in our fields, but the time of harvest comes, we cannot reap the harvest, we have to leave our homes, and we have to stay in this mountain, in these caves and in dens. We are the people who are supposed to inherit the promise. We are the children of Abraham. We are the ones who we say we belong to this living God who fights for us. But today we are in such desperate situation. Why has all these things happened to us? I do not know. You might be also thinking the same thing. Why has all these things happened to my life? Why is this happening to me? Then he goes on to say the second question. Where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? So what Gideon is trying to tell to the angel of the Lord? My fathers, my forefathers, they all talk about big things of this great and almighty God. But for the past seven years, we are seeing nothing but destruction. For past seven years, we are being destroyed by the ones whom we are called to overpower. Where is God gone? They talk about dividing a Red Sea, but we can see even a small river being divided. They are talking about manna coming from heaven and feeding our forefathers. Here we can't eat our own bread. They are talking about meat being provided by God. We are struggling to find wheat. They are talking about the waters gushing out of rock, uh, bitter water turning into sweet water. But today our life is miserable. 
Where are all his miracles? What has happened to Gideon? A man, a young boy who grew up in faith, hearing all the miraculous stories of God. Today, this young man has come to a place of doubt and maybe even unbelief. Where is God gone? And then he says in same verse number 13, but now the Lord has abandoned us. Can you imagine? And sometimes we say that only, you know, when something goes wrong in our life, God left me and went. I don't think so. God leaves us and goes. We leave God and go in our own ways. Right in the very first verse of this chapter 6, it says, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And that's why through their evil deeds, they themselves opened up the doors for the enemy to attack into their lives. And that's what happens in a Christian life. When we move away from God, we voluntarily open up the doors of our spiritual life, of our mind, of our soul, for the enemy to attack into our lives. But what is Gideon saying and what do we say? The Lord has left us and gone. The Lord has given us in the hand of Median. The Lord has given my life and my family in the hand of the devil. Where is God? He doesn't care now. What is Gideon's perspective of God? A very weak perspective. A very weak impression of God. He has almost reached the place of unbelief. Yes, sometimes we may say that yeah, way, looking at the condition of my life, I don't see there is God. But in that situation, rather than telling, I don't see God, I have to ask myself that how far have I gone from God? So we can see Gideon has got complaints against God. Was God discouraged by hearing this? If I would have been in God's place, in that angel of the Lord's place, I was like, get lost this man. This man, I encouraged him, I motivated him, saying man of valor, and this fellow has hit back with all the negative things. But how did God respond? Let's look in verse number 14. It says, the Lord looked at him and said, our God is a God of mercy and grace. And that is why it's so fantastic, it's so overwhelming to serve him and to follow him, to walk with him. He understands what we are going through. It says, the Lord looked at him and said, go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Okay, you're saying that I have given you in the hands of Midian, I have given Israel in the hands of Midian, go. Now I am empowering you that you will go and deliver the children of Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? The Lord is saying, I am sending you. God responds with a promise. And that is what, even in the book of Exodus chapter 3, God responds Moses with a promise. When Moses says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? I am nobody. I cannot stand before Pharaoh. God says, I will be there with you. I am sending you. So God is encouraging Gideon over here, saying that, isn't it that I am I am sending you. Go in this might of yours and I will deliver Midianites into the hands, into your hands. So what is Gideon's response? By now I think so Gideon should be halfway down to the Midianites camp. But no, Gideon's response is with a problem. He has another problem. First he has got complaints about God. Now he has got a problem with himself. In verse number 15 of Judges chapter 6, Gideon said to the angel of the Lord, Oh Lord, so that means there is another problem happening. How shall I deliver Israel? Oh, this is quite a bit, you know. Here I am, I, fearful, lonely man, trying to hide from the Midianites, and you are telling me that I am going to fight against the Midianites and deliver Israel? How? He says, Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. What is. Gideon trying to say to the angel of the Lord, he is saying that our clan, the Abyssalite, are the least, are the weakest in Manasseh, and in my family, I am the smallest. So, angel of the Lord, I think so you, you have picked up the wrong one. And that's what even Moses said to God. God, I am not worthy. God, I cannot go and uh, speak before Pharaoh. Uh, Lord, if they ask me uh, who sent me, and all those many excuses Moses gave to God. What we can see here is that Gideon is not only bitter with God, but he is now filled with doubt of himself and he has got a very low self-image. He has got such a small self-image that it can fit in a thimble and still have room for his thumb. 
he has gone down to such a low self esteem like moses said in exodus chapter 3 verse 11 who am i that i should go to pharaoh who am i Saul, when he was going to be anointed as king in the book of First Samuel, chapter nine, he was hiding behind the equipment. He's saying, "No, no, how can I become the king of Israel, of God's people? No, 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 I don't want to become the king of Israel." Sometimes we ourselves have a very low self-image, and when we have been given the mandate to do what God has called us to do and when God reminds us of his promise that he shall be with us and empower us what do we do we look into ourselves and we say no i can't do it what does philippians paul says in chapter 4 verse 13 i can do all things to christ who gives me strength and gideon says no no lord no angel of the lord i am the least in my family and our clan is the weakest in the tribe of manasse but the lord doesn't give up in verse 16 the lord said to gideon surely i'll be with you and you shall defeat midian as one man some other version says you shall defeat midian and leave none alive god's promise is again coming to gideon saying that i will be with you and i will strengthen you and you are going to face the enemy as if you are facing one single man how much god is empowering gideon and when we see later on in judges chapter 7 you can spend time in this week and read the remainder of uh, judges chapter 6 and judges chapter 7 we see how god uses this fearful man this man who had such a low self esteem of himself this man who was so much having doubts about god how god uses this man because god had already declared over gideon that you are a mighty man of valor and that is what god is declaring over each one of us that when we decide to walk with god god is telling that you are a mighty man a mighty woman of valor god is great in your life and we can see god using gideon by just 300 men to defeat the enemy that were as numerous as the locust with what did he defeat with the blast of trumpets and torches of fire read it in Gen- uh, judges chapter 7 so what we can see here my dear friends is that many a times like gideon we have a mental block and we cannot see beyond our situation there was a pastor and a bishop of the church of the united brethren in christ his name was milton wright when a famed german glider pioneer crashed in a flying accident in 1896 the bishop this pastor he was afraid for his sons so he delivered a sermon in the church and he said if god had meant man to fly he would have given man wings well few years from there His sons, Orville and Wilbur Wright, went on to invent the first airplane. And seven years from that sermon, they took the first flight. Orville and Wilbur Wright heard that sermon, which was delivered by their dad, who was a pastor in that church. But they did not allow their minds to be blocked by saying, "No, there can be a possibility that man can fly." And today we all know. the advantages and the blessing of flight movement flight transport consider this quotes in ending someone said he is a commissioner of us patent office in 1899 he said this thing everything that can be invented has been invented it's been almost 121 years back but after that we have seen so many inventions an executive from the world's leading telegraph company in 1876 said the telephone has too many shortcomings to be a means of communication today we cannot do without a phone the chairman of ibm in 1943 he said this statement i think there is a world market for maybe five computers maximum five computers will be used in the world today you and i know how much widely the computers are being used a few individuals which i want to highlight who are from normal daily life 
a woman called Wilma Rudolph. She was a 20th child of the 22 siblings from a father of two marriages. She was a premature child. She suffered from pneumonia and scarlet fever early in her childhood. At the age of five, she was diagnosed with polio and doctors told she will have to use leg braces for the rest of her life. History. Wilma, you cannot see beyond this what happened. She won three gold medals in the Summer Olympics in Rome 1960. She won the 100 meter race, 200 meter race, 4 by 100 meter relay. She was acclaimed the fastest woman in the world in the 1960s and became the first American woman to win three gold medals in a single Olympic Games. In 1976, at the age of 14, Nadia Komnichi was the first gymnast to be awarded a perfect score of 10 at the Summer Olympics game in Montreal. At the same game, she received six more perfect tens for events on the way of winning three gold medals. Till that time, no gymnast had scored a perfect 10. In fact, the traditional Olympic scoreboard manufacturer had been led to believe that competitors could not receive a perfect 10 and hence he had not programmed the scoreboard to display that score. It was understood that nobody can get a perfect 10. Till 1976, this girl at the age of 14 got perfect 10 seven times in the same Olympics. Adi Dassler was a simple shoemaker from a small town in Germany. He was inspired by his passion for sports and athletes that he pioneered an entire industry and became the founder of the world's largest and most innovative sports company called Adidas. He was a simple shoemaker from a small town in Germany. But something stirred within him, said that I don't want to just be a simple cobbler, but I want to do something of my life. And today we know what Adidas is. If these men and this woman can do something of their life, what about you and me? When we have this promise of God which says, I am with you, I am for you, and I will accomplish all of my purposes in and through your life. God did not leave Gideon in his struggle. Gideon complained to God. Gideon even went on to say that I cannot do it because I am weak. But God did not leave Gideon. We, I would have left Gideon and said, okay, forget it. I will go to somebody else who is more motivated. But God, hold on to Gideon and change Gideon's life so that he could bring change in the lives of the children of Israel. And by the end of Judges chapter 7 and then in chapter 8, we see Gideon becoming one of the great judge of Israel. Today I pray that even as you are listening to this message, that God will cause you to open up your eyes. Just like how Elisha prayed, Lord, I pray that my servant's eyes shall be opened. In the book of 2 Kings chapter 6, I pray that our eyes shall be opened. That we may not see life through our own lenses, but we shall see our lives through the lens of Almighty God. Let us pray. Dear Father, we want to thank you for this word. We want to thank you that you are a God not only of Gideon, but you are a God of each and every one of our lives. And Father, even through Gideon, you are inspiring us today that you are calling us to see beyond our lives. You are calling us to see beyond our situations. You are calling us to see beyond our failures. And you are calling us to see who you are and what you have promised in your word. And what Holy Spirit can do in and through our lives. I pray, Father, in the mighty name of your Son, that you will bring a breakthrough in our thinking. You will bring a breakthrough in our perspective. And that we will recognize that you are a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can think or imagine. May all glory and honor belong to you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, Lord. May the love of our Heavenly Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us.
Amen.